Well, good evening. Welcome to the live stream for the Wednesday evening uh, service here at Kings Park Baptist Church. And uh, we're delighted to have you join us this evening. And uh, we're looking forward to God doing some great things tonight. Let's begin with our song service as I'm going to ask uh, Brother Ben Tovar to come and lead in the singing tonight. Brother Ben. All right, amen. Let's turn in our hymnals to page 49, or 59 rather, Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. All right, Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. Days are filled with sorrow and care, hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. A little bit faster. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted. Jesus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today. Leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near on the third troubled soul the Savior can see every heartache and fear burdens are lifted at Calvary Jesus is very near burdens are lifted at Calvary Calvary, Calvary, burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Amen. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer this evening. Father, we thank you so much that we can go to Calvary for our burdens to be lifted. Thank you, Father, that we can depend on you, that you are always the same, you don't change, you don't waver, that, Father, in you there is comfort, there is peace, there is hope, there is joy, and, Father, our burdens are lifted. We take them to the cross of Christ and we lay them at the feet of the Savior who died for mankind, that we might be redeemed and have everlasting life. Father, we thank you so much for those burdens being lifted at Calvary. Lord, we pray tonight that our hearts would be moved by your spirit. Pray that you would have free reign in us to mold us and to shape us to be what we ought to be. Lord, guide our study of your word. Help us in all things tonight to glorify you. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is good to have you with us tonight uh, here for our midweek service. And in the way of uh, an announcement, if you have not heard... Uh, this coming Sunday, which is commonly referred to as Easter Sunday. Around here we call it Resurrection Sunday. And uh, we're excited about celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who was crucified on the cross to pay for our sins. And the Bible teaches that he was in the tomb for three days and three nights. And then he rose again in the morning on the first day. And so the, the timeline for that would be that Jesus would have been uh, would have died on Wednesday and would have been put in the tomb on Wednesday. And I'm so glad that's not the end of the story because he was in the tomb for those three days and three nights. And he rose again on the uh, first day of the week, which would be Sunday morning in the Jewish calendar. And uh, I'm so thrilled and so thankful that we can today celebrate a risen Savior. And so this Sunday, we don't want to do that with empty chairs. We want to do that with uh, God's people gathering together. And so we're inviting each and every one of you to, if you don't have a church already, to come and to join us here at Kings Park Baptist Church in southwest Oklahoma City. 
And we're going to have a drive-in service, so everything will be uh, safe, and we'll have uh, people spaced apart so that uh, you're not too close to anybody. I can't do anything about the people that are inside your car, okay? Uh, if you bring a car full of people, uh, maybe you might want to wear masks or something, or if you're family members, you've already been sharing germs anyways, but uh, do your best inside your car to keep some space between you. But we will have space between each car, and uh, we'll, we'll have the doors open for people to use the restrooms, but we'll ask people to be very careful to use spacing uh, as they walk in and out of the building. And uh, we're going to have a great time praising God on Sunday, on Resurrection Sunday here at Kings Park Baptist Church. And I hope you'll make it a point to be here with us and to enjoy uh, some time together with God's people. It's going to be so good to see our church family again. We've been missing you all, and uh, I hope you've been missing us, but we've sure been missing you, and so we'll look forward to seeing you again on this Sunday. If you would, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to the book of Titus. <clears throat> book of Titus. We have, uh, last Wednesday night, we, we started studying in the book of Titus, and as I mentioned last week on Wednesday, that Titus is one of those books of the New Testament that is commonly referred to as a pastoral epistle. And what that means is that uh, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote this letter to a young man who was learning to be a pastor, learning to be in the office of pastor in the local church to be uh, in that position of great responsibility and great accountability that we have before God. And just as he did with Timotheus and just as he did with Philemon, Paul with Titus did not just give him the task, uh, or rather I should say God did not just give him the task because we are not called of men, we're called of God. And though, though a great man Paul was, he certainly was not God and not the Holy Spirit. And uh, he didn't speak for God or the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in, uh, uh, inspired him and caused him to speak the words that God wanted him to say in the scriptures. And so uh, Titus, being instructed after he was called of God, being instructed by God's words through the Apostle Paul, we have this letter here, and that, that is our basis for instruction and for training in the ministry today. Last Sunday night, we looked at the idea of serving God in the local church and why we serve him and how we serve him and so forth. And I pray that was a blessing to you. But we pick up tonight. We didn't get very far last week. <laughs> we pick up tonight uh, for, for the sake of, uh, of, of just revisiting and, and refreshing in our minds. Let's go ahead and read these first uh, we'll go ahead and read the first four verses of Titus chapter 1. You follow along silently as I read aloud. Verse 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Lord, we pray that you would bless this time, and that, Father, you would bless our hearts and minds to be open to your Holy Spirit's leading. I pray, Father, that you'd fill me with your power as I preach. Lord, you know the things that are on my heart tonight and, and the distractions of everyday living that are, that are afflicting all of us. I pray, Father, you would help us tonight to put all of that stuff aside and to focus on the Word of God. Help us tonight, Lord, to hear and to listen with a listening ear, to, to absorb and to retain and to act upon the things that your Spirit brings to our hearts and minds tonight. Father, just pray that this time be blessed of you. Help us, Lord, to be better servants of you after this evening is over. In Jesus' name, amen. And the, the thing that I want you to see here 
In these first couple of verses is about the relationships that are dealt with here. Paul's relationship uh, with the Lord. Of course, you're familiar, uh, may, well, maybe you're not familiar, but I hope you're familiar with the story of uh, the Apostle Paul, how he became the Apostle Paul, because he started off as a Pharisee named Saul. And uh, Saul was a very zealous man for the law, for the Pharisees and, and the keeping of the Old Testament law, so much so that he willingly and gladly participated in, in imprisoning believers in Christ and in persecuting them and even in seeing some of them put to death as he stood by and the Bible says that he was consenting unto the death of Stephen. Uh, in the book of Acts. And so uh, Saul was a, a wicked man. Uh, he was a zealous man for the law, but a wicked man in that he was using that as an excuse to persecute the church of Jesus Christ there in Jerusalem. And uh, the Bible teaches us that uh, Saul was converted. Uh, he saw a bright light on the road to Damascus, and uh, he heard the voice of God saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me. And uh, the Bible teaches that Saul was converted. He was not converted by the light. He was not converted by the voice. He was converted when he took his faith out of the keeping of the law and put his faith in the crucified and resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. So Paul's conversion and salvation was exactly the same in its, in its essential elements as anyone else's. He had to con recognize he was a sinner and he had to confess his need, and he had to put his faith in Jesus as the Son of God, dying and rising again in order for Paul to be saved, or Saul rather. And then after he was saved, God changed his name to Paul, and he, and, uh, he instructed him in New Testament doctrine, thereby giving him status as a person holding the office of an apostle. And so this was the relationship that Paul had is where he had been blinded by the law and by his, uh, his, his teaching of the law. Uh, he, was, he was given sight spiritually at the time when he, we, we believe, lost sight physically, or at least lost a majority of his sight physically. And so Paul was, it had a great relationship with God and thankfulness that he, he did not deserve to be saved. He was saved in spite of what a wicked person he had been persecuting the cause of Christ. And then we see the relationship between Paul and Titus, as he says here in verse 4, to Titus, mine own son. And again, if you've been with us on Sunday evenings, as we have been in 1 Timothy and now in 2 Timothy, we see the Apostle Paul refer to Timotheus in the same manner as mine own son, or even as mine own beloved son. And uh, the idea here is not of a of a uh, familial relationship. Paul did did not sire these two young men, but of a spiritual relationship, where Paul was instrumental in their salvation, instrumental in their discipleship, and instrumental in their further training for the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, let me just say that there are there are a lot of great pastors. Uh, specifically here in the United States. There's a lot of great pastors of independent fundamental Baptist churches of, of like faith and practice with our church. There are some great Bible colleges uh, that teach and, and uh, instruct in the ministry. Uh, there are some great men of God, uh, people that I count as, as role models for myself and, and for other, other pastors that they, uh, they, they can see great example, examples in their lives of following Christ. But we need to understand something tonight, that God does not call on us to imitate or to follow after any man, not even the Apostle Paul. Titus and Timotheus and Philemon were not instructed to follow Paul, they were instructed to follow Christ. And today, we're not instructed to follow some of the great Bible teachers and preachers of our time or even of previous generations, but we are instructed to follow Jesus Christ. And so even though there's this great relationship between Paul and Titus, the real relationship is that between the servant of God 
and God who is worthy to be served. Because the, the truth of the matter is this. I was not a Pharisee in the Old Testament temple. I was not a persecutor of the church. I didn't imprison anybody. I didn't persecute anybody for their faith. I didn't have anyone stoned to death. I did not uh, rob any gas stations or banks. I didn't kill anybody. I wasn't involved in narcotics. In fact, I was a very young boy when I came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But the fact of the matter is, that little boy living in, in southern Wisconsin, northern Illinois area, ha had just as much of a need to be saved from his sinful condition as Saul the Pharisee, the persecutor of the church. And, and so I can say today that I don't serve God because my dad was a pastor. I don't serve God because, it, as has been referred to me, uh, the family business. It's not by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I don't serve God because I think it's an easy way to make a living. It certainly isn't. I don't serve God because I, I, I have a, uh, an ex expectation upon me. I serve God because he's worthy to be served because he saved me from my sins. And let me tell you, friend, today, if you don't know Jesus Christ, I want you to understand that God is worth serving. I often hear people say when I'm witnessing to them, well, you know, what would I have to give up to follow Christ? And the truth of the matter is, you don't have to give up anything, but you better understand God's going to make you want to give up some things. And, and your flesh is going to fight against that. And, and, and the question becomes, are you really repentant of your sinful condition? And if so, then you, you really ought to be willing to give up some things. But even if you aren't willing to give up anything, if you are willing to give yourself to Jesus Christ, he can make you willing to give up things because of an understanding of who God is and that he's worthy of being served. We look on in verse 5, it says this, and I'm, uh, there's a lot more I could say about those relationships, but I really want to get into the text tonight, kind of into the meat of the book of Titus. And verse 5 says this, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So this is Titus's mission. Paul says to Titus, I left you in Crete for the purpose that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. Uh, I remember when I was a little boy growing up and on occasion my, my uh, siblings and I, my mom would come in to, to the house or if she's in the house, she'd come into the living room where we were and she would say, okay, we're going to put away the toys and we're going to turn off the TV and, and uh, we're, going to, we're going to stop playing and, and we're going to clean the house. And she would instruct my sisters with their assignments and then she would give me my chore assignments and she would give my brothers their chore, chore assignments. And in, inevitably, one of us at some point during the assignment of chores would ask my mom and say, well, is somebody coming to visit? Are we having company? Are we having a missionary family come in? Or, or is somebody from church coming over? And my mom would always say this. She would say, no, it doesn't matter who else is coming. What matters is that we live here. And I remember as a kid thinking, well, I live here, but I'm pretty happy with how it is. I mean, I didn't, didn't really care if it was clean or not. As an adult, uh, I found myself saying kind of that same thing to my kids at times. Uh, we, you know, we do our chores, we clean house because we live here. And uh, when, you, when you are someplace, when you live someplace, you want things to be set in order. Uh, my, my wife and my kids will sometimes tease me about the condition of my, my desk in my study. Um, it is, uh, I believe if it was an apartment, you would call it the lived-in look. Uh, my, my desk is, has a tendency to develop uh, highly organized piles of things that need to be done. 
And uh, so my, my wife will sometimes ask me where something is, and I'll say, well, it's on my desk. And then in our, in our early days of our marriage, the early days of my ministry, she would on occasion offer to come in and straighten out my desk for me. And I would always say, no, 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 no. If you come in and straighten out my desk the way you like it, then I won't be able to find anything on it. And so I would, I would refuse her help. And that's the way that we see here with Paul telling to, to, speaking to Titus. He's not telling Titus, go to Crete and set things the way you think they ought to be done. He's not even telling Titus to go to Crete and set things in the church the way that Paul thinks they ought to be done. Rather, he's telling Titus that he's to stay there in Crete and he's to set things in, that are wanting in order the way that God wants them to be done. And listen tonight, there are many churches in America that have fallen prey to the false teaching that you can, you can have a worshipful relationship with God by appealing to your own flesh, to your own emotions. No, 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 friend. The way you worship God is by denying yourself and coming to Him and saying, Lord, set in order in my life these things that are wanting just as we would have in the, in the church. You know, if I walk into the church and it's, it's uh, Sunday morning time for, we're getting ready for Sunday school, for church services, and the song books are all on the floor and the chairs uh, are dusty and the carpet's got dirt on it or trash on it and, and uh, you know, I'm going to get some people together and we're going we're gonna to set things in order. We're going to put the songbooks where they go. We're going to clean the chairs and we're going to vacuum the floor and, and uh, we're going to take care. We're going to set it the way it needs to be. And what this tells us is that God has a way that is right for the local church to be. Set in order the things that are wanting. We think of the word want and we think that that implies some kind of a a desire or a, a lack, but it's a bigger meaning than that. That word wanting doesn't just refer to, the, to establishing the things that are lacking, but it, it refers specifically to a place where something once was, but it's been moved. Maybe you've had a piece of heavy furniture in your house and, and you had to move it for some reason. I know up here on the platform where I'm standing, we have this wooden pulpit, and uh, the carpet on the platform is a, a, a burgundy carpet, and, and uh, there, there was uh, something, we were doing something one day in here, I don't remember what it was, and, and uh, I think we were, we were taking some pictures or something, and we had moved the, the pulpit, and we were trying to get it put back in exactly the same place, and my, my son-in-law was here, and and he was visiting, and he was helping set the pulpit in place. And I, I kept looking at it, and I kept saying, I don't think that's the right spot. And, uh, and, and it didn't look right from any angle. It didn't look centered on the platform. And then it was either my son or my son-in-law said, well, Dad, look. And I looked down, and he lifted up. They kind of rocked the pulpit forward, and I could see where the pulpit has sat for many years, the indentations in the carpet. They said, see? It is right back in the place where it was. And listen tonight, God is not looking for us to set up a new way to have church. God is not wanting us to develop some new system, system of theology. God is not wanting us to develop a different way of worship. God wants us to put back in his church in the place that he ordained for it to be, the worship of God and the instruction of his people. Set in order the things that are wanting. And then he goes on and says this, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Paul says to, to Titus, I want you to make sure that there is a, a person that is called of God and that is legitimately called of God, and that is knowledgeable in the things of God, and, and you're going to ordain them. You're going to set them in charge. You're going to put them and charge them with the keep of God's people in that place. You know, there's uh, different, different groups of people that want to deny that 
that churches should even exist. Groups of people that want to deny that there should ever be a pastor. And I've always wondered what they do with verses like verse 5 of Titus chapter 1, where God's word so clearly says to ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. God does not intend his flock to wander without supervision, to wander without the under-shepherd who is accountable to the shepherd, the great shepherd. The under-shepherd is accountable to the great shepherd because the under-shepherd is selected by the great shepherd to hold that position of responsibility. In other words, the under-shepherd's job is to make sure that things don't get moved around in the church. That we don't have to come back and set things in order because they have stayed in order because the under-shepherd has fulfilled his responsible and accountable job. And then he goes on in verse 6 and he gives, the, he gives the qualifications for this. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. Not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, and temperate. Qualifications for the pastor. And I, I sometimes will hear pastors say, and I have even said myself, that uh, there's, there's a high mark of responsibility for the office of pastor. But really, if you read these qualifications, you realize what God is just saying here is, look, you need to live right. <laughs> uh, God, there, there's, there's no greater uh, uh, level of spirituality that you have to attain to be qualified for the ministry than pretty much is expected of any Christian. To, to be blameless. You know, Christians have been commanded to be holy as God is holy. Let me tell you, if you're exercising holiness as God does, you're blameless. You're blameless. He, it goes on and says, the husband of one wife. The marriage covenant between a man and a woman is not, uh, uh, not limited by man's willfulness. It is, it is conducted with this vow till death do us part. And there are some that don't like this teaching, but you can take it up with the Lord because it's in the word of God. When you have made the vow before God till death do us part, then the only thing that releases from that vow is death. And I've heard all the arguments. Oh, well, the Old Testament, Moses got divorcements for the people of, for the children of Israel. That wasn't God's plan. That was Moses' plan. And just because God allowed it doesn't mean that God said, okay, if you get married again, I'm not going to count that. I've heard people say it was uh, the husband of one wife at a time. You know, that's, that's so ridiculous as it boggles the mind. The husband of one wife is very simple. The wife whom you have vowed to love, honor, and cherish until death do us part. If your wife is alive, you're bound by that vow. And if you haven't lived up to that vow, then you cannot fulfill the responsibilities of the office of pastor. It goes on, having faithful children. I mean, faithful children. You know, there's, uh, I, I've known some great men of God whose kids have gotten to the upper teen and early adult years and have gone away from the teachings of the Word of God, have uh, renounced uh, their faith in Christ or or gone on just, just backslidden in general. And I've known men of God who have uh, just agonized or whether or not that meant they were disqualified. I don't, I don't believe they are because I think everybody has to make their own decisions on their own relationship with God. I think it's more a question of what were they instructed? How were they taught? You know, I'm, I, I think more of the young pastor who has a young family and, uh, and I'm not talking about kids just being kids. Man, let me tell you something. When I was a little boy in church, uh, if, if my dad was the pastor, he was up preaching. And, uh, and, if, and if we misbehaved, my mom took us out and she taught us to behave. And, uh, and then when we got home, dad taught us again to behave. 
Uh, they made sure we were instructed. It's not that we never misbehaved, it's that we were instructed that we were to behave. We were, we were kept under control. And so that's the idea here behind the faithful children. And not accused of riot or unruly. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, a person who is not out trying to stir up things and, and trying to cause problems. You know, as ministers of the gospel of peace, we certainly ought not to be instigators of trouble. Verse 7, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. The idea of faithfulness comes in there. Faithful with the things that God has given us. Not self-willed, not in, in it for himself, not soon angry. Uh, let me tell you, there's times in the ministry where it's real easy to slip into the flesh and to get angry, but you don't have a right to do that when you're representing Christ. Not given to wine. That doesn't mean uh, not uh, being falling down drunk. That means not partaking of alcoholic beverages. No striker. Not a person going around looking for a fight. Not given to filthy lucre. Not looking to pad our own nests and, and to, to always in it. What's in it for me? You know, what, uh, uh, this church, I can only get paid this much, but I go to this church over here, I can get paid this much. That's not how the ministry works. And if that's how you're in it, then you're not qualified for the ministry. Verse 8, but a lover of hospitality. And we think of hospitality, we typically think of letting people into our homes. The idea here of hospitality is an idea of welcoming and friendly to all. This is the year 2020. I am mystified that this far into created civilization, there are still people who desire to have a separating of races. No, no, don't get me wrong. There's different cultures, and, there's, and that's fine. And there's, there's differences in the way we do things, depending on your ethnicity, and that's fine. But when it comes down to worshiping God, the Word of God says in Christ there's neither Jew nor Gentile. That pretty well co covers it all. Uh, but there are those who, who will say, oh, you're of a different ethnic background, you can't come to our church, or, or you're of a different uh, class of society, you can't come to our church. Let me tell you, a church ought to be welcoming to everyone. Somebody asked me one time, well, would you allow a person come to your church who's involved in some gross immorality? And I would say, well, you know what, I would let a person come to our church who is involved in the same sin that I'm involved in. Because I'm a sinner. And, and, the, and the church doors are not only for those who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. The church doors are for those who recognize they need to be redeemed by the blood of Christ. Now, how should they believe except they hear? And how should they hear without a preacher? So, yeah, you better believe I'd let somebody come to my church. I wouldn't let them join the church. You've got to be saved, baptized, and agree with our doctrinal statement to be a member. But you can sure come and listen to the preaching. Not going to let somebody come in and, and practice some immorality in our presence, but you can sure come in and listen to the preaching because we're to be hospitable. Lover of good men. You know, we ought to love righteousness. We ought to love righteousness. We ought not to hold in high regard and esteem somebody because of a, an academic connection through a college or because of a, a, a geographic connection, because we, we grew up listening to them in, their, in our home church, whatever. We ought not to hold people in esteem for those reasons. We ought to hold people in esteem because they follow Christ. It goes on. Just, holy, temperate. These qualifiers for the office of the pastor. Paul is saying to Titus, look, you need to... You need to set people in, in, in the position of elders in these cities as, and, and ordain them, as I've told you. You need to set things in order in the churches, put the things back where they once were. You need to stay there in Crete. You need to take care of these things. And then most of all, we see the most important thing in verse 9, holding fast the faithful word, as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. 
I saw a little thing this afternoon on the uh, on social media on the internet. It was meant to be satire, but frankly, I'm afraid it hit a little too close to home for some people. And it said this: that surveys have shown that 90% of Christians get their doctrine from a bumper sticker instead of from the Bible. And I'm afraid that's true. <laughs> I'm afraid too many Christians are involved in what I call cliché Christianity. They have no idea what it actually means to follow Christ. The concept of picking up their cross is so foreign of a concept to some believers they wouldn't even recognize it. The idea of, of a person uh, following, giving up everything and following Christ and and, uh, and, and studying the Word of God and being discipled in the Word of God, it's just a lot of work. And then people are naturally lazy. They don't, want to, they don't want to do the work. And so it's much easier to hear a few catchy phrases and just put those cliches out. People think you're spiritual, and you can just go on your merry way. But the, the man of God, the servant of God, is to hold fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. God help us tonight that so many churches are going with that which is convenient, they're going with that which is popular, they're going with that which is new and fresh sounding, and they're turning away from the tried and true Word of God, the, the, the foundation of what the church is to be built upon. And they're turning away from that because they found something shiny and new that they think is better. That's not what God wants. God wants men to come in and to serve him in churches who are faithful. Who are faithful. And they're faithful to the word. By sound doctrine. To exhort and to convince the gainsayers. You know... And, and I'm speaking here to myself and to other men that are pastors or men that maybe want to be a pastor someday. I don't care how good of an apologist you are. I don't care how persuasive you are. I don't care how forceful you can be or how good looking you are. Or what, I don't care about any of that. I care about this. Do you know the Word of God? Do you have a genuine relationship with God that manifests itself in your love for Christ and your service for him. Because if you don't have that, don't, don't, don't you dare waste anybody's time pretending to represent Christ and be in the ministry. I mean, I've known some people that were, were articulate and, and eloquent speakers and and, uh, you know, just the, 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 the perfect, they look like they just walked out of a, a, a Wall Street banking firm. I mean, they're perfectly dressed. They look nice. They've got the right education credentials. They, they've got everything. You know, they just tick all the boxes. But they, they don't have a real love for the Lord. It's evident. And I've known, you know, people that, that you know, the, 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 what comes to mind is the, the, the idea of the old country preacher. Now, you know, the guy that maybe back in the early 1900s, he'd only completed 8th or ninth grade in, in school. And, and uh, he didn't, didn't talk real eloquent, and he didn't preach real, real uh, uh, eloquently, but, but boy, he loved Christ. And when he talked about Jesus and what he'd done for lost sinners, the old country preacher started to, to, to tear up and to cry. And let me tell you, he's not using emotionalism. It's just he has such a fervent love for Christ that it shows. Well, I'll take that every day of the week. Because that's one who's going to hold fast to sound doctrine. Who's going to use sound doctrine to exhort and to convince rather than trying to manipulate and to control. Verse 10, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. One of the big problems that was evident there in, in the time of the writing of the book of Titus was you had uh, the, the, the Jews that would come into a Gentile community and would tell the Gentiles who were saved and gathered together and worshiping Christ, well, that's fine, you can worship Christ, but now you need to go back and you need to keep the law too. And they would try to mix in other things with the gospel. And Paul says to Titus here, he said, listen, there's some unruly people. There's some vain talkers 
and just out and out deceivers. Deceivers. I was talking with somebody recently about a, they'd asked me about a preacher that I knew about, and I said, I don't know anything good. And, and here's what I know that that person has said, not what I've heard, what I know that that person has said. And they, they, this, this man is not a pastor of an independent fundamental Baptist church. He's not, not, you know, not anybody that anybody should try to figure out who it is. But they said, Pastor, well, what do you think about this guy and, and some things he's said and written? I said, well, look, here's what I know. I've heard him say these things. And they're contrary to Scripture. They're contrary to Scripture. And the person said, well, but, but Pastor Moore, you know, they're, they're, he's, uh, he, he's, he's very well known. And I said, well, that's great. That doesn't make him any more right. And, and the person said, well, well but, but, but Pastor Moore, surely you don't think he's lying. And I stopped for a second. I said, you know, his, his motivation is not really what's important. He could mean well. But that's not going to fix it. You know, I mean, if I, if I come across a scene of a person that's engulfed in flames and there's a bucket with some liquid next to them, and I mean well, and I take that bucket thinking it's water and throw it on them, but it's really kerosene. Uh, all my good intentions didn't make the situation better. So that, that person is not preaching sound doctrine. They may have good intentions. That doesn't make the situation better. But the truth of the matter is, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you are indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. And if you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is in us to convince of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And so if the Holy Spirit of God is indwelling the believer, and that believer goes to, to uh, uh, declare sound doctrine, but they're wrong in their doctrine, the Holy Spirit is going to bear witness in that person. And they can't say they didn't know, which makes them a deceiver. A deceiver. You need to be careful of deceivers. And, and Paul even tells Titus, there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. Go down to verse 11. Whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. This isn't really a litmus test, but it is worthy of note. Nobody ever preaches sound doctrine in order to have more money, more prestige, a bigger church, a nicer car, bigger salary. It's not how it works. <laughs> not how it works. People have compromised scripture to have those things. People have been willing to compromise on the stand that they once took because they wanted to be popular with their own children as they grew older. I remember I used to tell my kids on a regular basis when they were young, I would sit them down and I'd point my finger at them and I'd say, listen to me, I will not be made a hypocrite for you. The day will come when you'll be out of my house and you live by your own rules when you're out of my house. But I understand I will never go back on the things that I've preached. So if you choose to live in a way that is contrary to what I have preached, the word of God says a believer ought to do, I'm not going to change what I preach and say, well, that doesn't apply anymore because I don't want people to think badly of you. I don't want people to think badly of my kids. But the truth is, if they live in a way that is contrary to the word of God, they know that their dad is going to be the first one to stand up and say, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. I tell you, parents, Christian parents tonight, you maybe you're thinking, well, Pastor Moore, you don't know what it's like. I do know what it's like. And I know this. I don't need to tell you all the details, but I can tell you this. Had my wife and I not made that stand with one of our kids, that young person would not today be serving the Lord. But because we took the stand, they realized this was a line. And it caused them to pull up and to see. It's not about dad and mom. It's about them and the Lord Jesus Christ. And today they're living right and they're serving the Lord because we made that stand. We wouldn't give up. We wouldn't, we wouldn't contradict what we had always said. 
Christian, listen to me tonight. Whether it's your own kids or somebody else's kids. Because the Bible says this is how whole houses are subverted. By the, by the compromising and the changing of the word of God. By saying, well, you know, it's not so bad, I guess. Because, I mean, my kids do it. I love my kids, so they're not bad. I, of course, they're not bad. Listen, I love my kids. I love my grandkids. But I love Jesus Christ more than I love my kids and my grandkids. And I've got to be faithful to him and to his word. Teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Filthy lucre's sake. You know. <laughs> I was talking to a guy many years ago, about maybe 15 years ago. And this guy said, well, you know, pastors that get a salary are just in it for the filthy lucre. And I said, well... <laughs> I said, I don't think you understand how much pastors get paid. <laughs> That's, if I was in it for the filthy lucre and I settled for, for the, the amount that pastors generally get paid, I wouldn't be a very smart individual. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not complaining. I'm just saying, you know, most pastors don't make a huge amount of money. But there are things that people are, will be willing to do in order for money, and by its definition, whether it's $100 or a $1 million dollars, if you've, if you've compromised the truth for the sake of financial gain, then it's become filthy. It's become filthy. Verse 12, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Well, the Apostle Paul must not have read the book on how to win friends and influence people. He just called it the way God said to call it. He said, this is a common saying among their own people. That the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. And then basically what it means is they'll take the easiest way. They'll, they're, they're lazy, basically. Intellectually lazy. And I don't mean this as a, as a racial thing or an ethnic thing. I just mean this was the, the common mindset of a lot of people at the time in the culture of the writing of this book. This was a mindset in this part of the world to just take whatever was the easiest way. There was no sense in doing anything difficult. He says, this witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. <laughs> a little boy came up to me one Sunday after church. We lived in Wisconsin. And he said, you yell too much. <laughs> well, boy about five years old. I said, nobody asked you, kid. No, I'm just kidding. I, I didn't say that. I said, do you know why I yell? And I called him by his name. And he said, no. I said, because I want to make sure that people are listening. And I said, I said, if you were running towards the street and there was a car coming, would you want me to call your name and just say, Be, sit down now. Don't, don't run out in the street. Real quiet. Or would you want me to jump up and down and yell and scream and make sure you heard me so you didn't run out in the street? He said, well, I want you to yell so I don't get hit by the car. I said, well, there you go. He said, I don't want you to get hit by a spiritual car. Paul says here to sharply rebuke them that they may be sound in the faith. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. We should no more listen to the person who says that there is more that you have to do to be saved than believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and confessing your sinful condition and receiving his gift. You shouldn't listen to the person who says, in addition to that, you need to get baptized. In addition to that, you need to do this. No, there is no addition to that. Confessing your need as a sinner, believing in Christ the Son of God and his death on the cross, and receiving his gift of eternal life. That's it. And we should no more listen to the person who adds to the gospel than the person who says, well, you know, that stuff is nice, but there's some ways we can do that that are a little bit easier. They're fables. They're fables. They're false teachings. Verse 15. Under the pure, all things are pure. But under them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Paul says to Titus, you need to understand, the, the, the believer will at some point want to do right. 
But the person who's defiled, even their conscience is defiled. You won't be able to get their attention. You won't be able to get them convinced and rebuked. Why? Verse 16, they profess that they know God. But in works, they deny him. Being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work, reprobate. As we're, as we're looking at Paul's instruction here tonight for serving God in the local church, maybe you're thinking, well, I'm not called to be a pastor, but this, is, this goes beyond just being a pastor. This is, this is for every believer. If you're not the one that is declaring sound doctrine, then you ought to be the one that is receiving sound doctrine. And if you're not receiving sound doctrine... If you're, if, you're, if you're going after things that are false teachings, you're going after easier teachings, maybe you're going after the things that are more popular, you need to listen to this tonight. They profess that they know God. A number of years ago, I was officiating in a basketball tournament for Christian schools and churches and and uh, there was a, a school there, or, or rather a church there, that, uh, th that I was familiar with the church. I knew where it was. I kind of knew. I didn't, I didn't know anybody well there, but I, I had met someone there. And that man was a police officer in that community, and that was and had stuck with my, in my mind. I remembered meeting him because he had told me he was a police officer, then he worked in the church and stuff. And and uh, so I, I, I was, this was some years later that I was at this, this basketball tournament, and, and uh, this, this one coach for a team came up to me and, and introduced him, uh, his team and said they were from that church. And I said, oh, I said, is that such a church in this place? And he said, yes. And I said, oh. I said, I know somebody from that church. He said, you do? What, what's his name? And I said, I know uh, uh, Brother So-and-so from that church. He's a police officer. And the guy looked at me, he's like, oh, you know him? I said, well, yeah, I know him. I said, uh, I said, I met him a number of years ago. And he said, oh. He said, uh, he said do, you, do you not recognize me? And I said, well, no. And he said, I'm him. I'm that guy. I said, oh, man. I, didn't, I said, I, I really, I had your, your face with a different name and your, and your name with, with a different face. I said, I apologize. I said, I, I, I do remember. He goes, yeah, I remember meeting you. But he said, you'd be surprised how many times people tell me that they know me and they don't know me. <laughs> and I laughed and I said, I said, nobody claims to know me. <laughs> and it's still that way today. But, <clears throat> but, uh, uh, but, you know, there's a lot of people that claim to know Jesus Christ. Sadly, they don't know him. Make a profession of faith. When I first moved here to Oklahoma City, I supplemented my income by working part-time driving for a rideshare program where people use an app on their phone and they call and you can go and pick them up, take them to a place, and drop them off, and they pay you money. And uh, so I was, I was riding one evening with this guy, and, and uh, he, he was pretty clearly uh, not in a good shape <laughs> physically. Uh, he was not sober, and... Uh, and the guy asked me what I did full time, and I said, I'm pastor of a Baptist church. And he said, oh, I'm a Baptist. And I said, oh, you are. And he said, yeah. And he started quoting scripture and tell me about going to Sunday school and, and hearing about you know, Moses and, in, the, in the basket and in the, in the river and, and uh, Daniel in the lion's den and, and Joseph and his coat. And, all. and he knew the, the Bible stories and he had a general idea of things. And, and I said, well, let me ask you. I said, where do you go to church today? He said, oh, I don't go to church anymore. And I said, well, how come? And he said, because I just decided it wasn't necessary. And I, and I asked him, I said, well, let me ask you this. I said, if you were to die today, do you know for sure where you spent eternity? And he said, well, I was baptized. I said, well, that's not what I'm asking you. Because you can get baptized and you didn't do anything but get wet if you, didn't, if you weren't saved. I said, I said, if you were to die today, have you put your faith in the blood of Christ to save you? And I remember him looking at me and he, and he almost seemed to sober up for a minute. And he said, I never bought into that. He said, I just figured if I lived a good enough life and I went to church some and I at least knew about being good, that was enough. And here he's going around professing but not possessing. 
Friend, tonight, listen to me. Maybe, maybe you have been righteous in your own estimation. Maybe somebody else has told you that the things you believe are good enough. And you should not listen to me or anybody else because of who we are. You should listen to this book. This is God's word. God's word says there are no works of righteousness which we can do. But according to his mercy, he saved us. God's word says very clearly, if you don't confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, then you're not saved. Because that's what's required to be saved. But tonight, if you're listening to this, or if you're listening to this uh, later on online or something, do your works show that, that you have been changed by God? Or do your works show that you desire?